Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Idea to Value podcast. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn, and I'm thrilled to have, uh, have with us today Christina Woodkey. She is a lecturer at Stanford and author of Radical Focus. We're going to be talking about how to get the most uh, productive uh, work done uh, with you and your team. Uh, and Christina, it's wonderful having you here today. Oh, I really appreciate you being willing to uh, have this conversation with me. I'm, I'm super uh, chuffed, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Love that word. Haven't heard it in a while. Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode, we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Now, Christina, for people who don't know about you and your work, uh, could you just give us a brief background as to where you got started and how you got to where you are now? Oh my gosh, you just asked the longest question possible. Um, I have always taken the scenic route in life. So right now I'm at Stanford teaching um, human computer action, trying to teach students to make computers be nice to people for a change. I think that's a pretty good job and uh, writing books about helping organizations be also nice to each other. So, but before that, um, I taught at CCA, uh, California College of the Arts. And before that I taught at, I didn't teach, I was in industry. I worked at Zynga, I worked at LinkedIn, I worked at Yahoo, I worked at MySpace. I just have been an industry person. And then one day I just got really burned out and wiped out and um, said, I'm done, let's do something else. With my time. Uh, and that's led you to where you are now, not only lecturing at Stanford, but the interesting topic for today, uh, helping people get more done. So uh, what, what sort of focus area you have the, around this ironically named <laughs> focus area? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, when I, when I left Zynga, which was my last industry job, I was completely wiped out. I had an ulcer, I had back pains. I just sort of laid on the floor for a while. I was lucky enough to make a little bit of money on the LinkedIn IPO so that I could take a break. And after a while I thought, well, I should do something but I have no idea what. And at Zynga I'd learned about OKRs, objectives and key results. And so I thought, well, I want to make enough money to live on. I want to have enough time to spend with my kid. Um, I want to be healthy. And so I just started using this Silicon Valley technique to focus my time because I'm the queen of shiny object syndrome. I'm like, oh, that looks cool. And that looks cool. And I want to learn about that. And that seems amazing. But the problem with that is you can't get anything big done that way. So instead, I first used it to try to figure out what I was going to do for a living. I went to culinary school for six weeks, you know, say, okay, do I want to be a chef? The answer was no, it makes your feet hurt. I worked for a startup for a while uh, that specialized in food because I love food. And I realized if I wanted to keep loving food, I should not work in that space. And then um, I tried out teaching and I really loved it and I kept going with it. Um, and then I thought, wow, OKRs have been really great. Maybe I should write a book about it. I don't, there are no book, books about it out there. And I wrote Radical Focus and it blew my mind. It really took off. So that's, uh, that's what focus does is you don't have to focus every part of your life, but you have to have that focus in order to move forward with the things that really matter to you. I, I think a lot of people have not heard of OKRs before. Uh, so what, what are they and what are they used for? Well, OKRs stand for objectives and key results. Uh, they came out of Intel when Andy Grove was managing it. Um, he had this idea that you hire really good people and then you tell them what results you want, and then you trust them to actually do it, which is to this day, a radical idea. And um, so what had happened is uh, John Doerr, who worked with him, came down to the Silicon Valley and he, uh, he introduced OKRs to all of the companies in his portfolio, including Google. Google is sort of the king, queen and prince of <laughs> OKRs, I guess. They use it for everything. Um, in my case, I ran into it at Zynga, which was another Doerr company. And um, I started using it for startups that I was advising at the time um, after I left. And the thing is that 
you don't set it for everything. It's not a project management tool at all. It's not about tracking all the things you're doing. What it is really about is saying, okay, this really matters to me, this objective. For example, you know, um, write this book, right? You know, Radical Focus does really well. Um, that might be an objective. I'm like, oh, I'd like to make some money so that I can spend more time with my kid. And then I say, well, what do I even mean by really well, right? Is it how many copies I sell? Is it how many good reviews I get? Is it how many stars it gets? And those are the key results. And those are the signals that say, you've done something really good. And so you set those goals, but the secret, the thing that actually makes OKRs work is the fact that every single week you look at them on a Monday morning and you say, what am I gonna do this week? You know, I've got all this crazy stuff going on in my life. I've got teaching, I've got, uh, you know, dishes that pile up like anybody else. I want to remember to set aside some time to work on this thing that really matters to me. And I know a lot of creative people are like, wow, I haven't, uh, I have gone weeks without painting. I've gone weeks without writing. And so this cadence of every Monday saying, did I actually get things done? What did I get done? Look at last week's priorities, learn what gets in your way, and then set new priorities based on that. That lets you do incredible stuff. Uh, I know it, it comes out of Silicon Valley. It makes a lot of sense there where you can track regular progress, especially when it comes to looking at how much code was written or how many bugs were fixed. And there's, there's easy ways to measure progress. Um, but is, is this something that can actually be applied to uh, other more um, hard to measure, uh, hard to quantify parts of life and work? Oh, absolutely. Um, so. Peter Drucker once said, what gets measured gets managed. And so um, I love trying to think of a way to measure things. It's fun. I know a lot of people like to use NPS, Net Promoter Score, uh, to measure uh, customers' happiness. But I think we're entering a time of NPS fatigue, if you will. I mean, think about how many times those darn pop-ups show up saying, would you recommend this to family or friends? And there's a sc scale of 10. So I often like to think, um, is there something that's going to be more meaningful? Is there going to is there something that's going to be strong? So you know, customer service calls is an easy one. Um, what if you count the positive ones where people write in just to say I love your service? How many of those are you getting? You know, that's a really strong signal, much stronger than this, right? Because writing in an email is annoying, and we have enough of those. Um, but if somebody loves you so much, they write in. That's great. Um, when I'm doing personal OKRs, I often do things like mood tracking. I have a giant calendar on my wall and every day I just write, draw a little um, smiley face or sad face, like the equivalent of an emoticon. And that way I can kind of start seeing, oh, you know, I feel better when I eat well or I feel better when I sleep more. Um, you can do team surveys every week. You can say, you know, one word, how are you feeling right now? And you could measure the positive words, and the negative words. Like, a little creativity to measurement is um, really important. The thing is to start thinking about, okay, these are our metrics, which one is gonna be the strongest signal? Which one can I actually trust? It's like the beginning of the days of the web when everybody was like views. And now we're like, yeah, views are nothing if you don't click or comment or convert into a buyer. So um, you can, if you think up like 20 metrics, like, oh, what's all the ways I could say our meetings are good, right? Um, you can say, okay, the strongest one is going to be this. We exit these meetings without having to set up a second one. Maybe that's a signal. Or you could try to measure how many people are on their phones. Um, but that means you actually have to count it. So thinking about metrics is actually a skill and you get better with it over time. I think that's one of the things that put people off OKR sometimes is they think you have to be perfect the first time you do it. And believe me, I've consulted so many people, nobody's perfect when they start. So just try something and see what happens. I, I have to admit, I've been on projects previously where we've used OKRs. Um, and there was a real challenge in, uh, in the team I was working with in that they wanted to, uh, from the outset, have OKRs that they knew they were gonna meet. And so either uh, they ended up writing OKRs, which were so vague that in retrospect, you could say, well, I, I did, I progressed on, on the work, <laughs> um, or they were uh, not set very high. So what goes into planning a, a good set of OKRs? You know, um, we have to go almost 
back to the question about the company itself. Is this a company that has psychological safety? This is one of the biggest things. I cannot recommend too highly Amy Edmondson's The Fearless Organization. She goes very deep into psychological safety. Maybe you've seen it as part of Google's writings. We've had, a, we've had her on the podcast before. I recommend everyone who's not listened to that episode yet uh, go and listen to that right after this one. I'm such a fangirl of Amy Edmondson's work, but it's just really wonderful. Um, so you, if you're not feeling safe at work, of course you're going to sandbag. Of course you're going to set low goals. The other question is, um, is the company connecting OKRs to performance review? And even more important, are they connecting it to compensation? Because the reality is we're all human beings. We all have rent to pay. We all have, some of us have kids to put in college. Some of us have dogs to pay the dog walker, whatever, what have you. But you know, if you're tying somebody's livelihood to whether or not they hit a goal, of course you're going to set a low goal. Duh, right? You've got to stay safe. Um, and I'm sure Amy talked about uh, the problems with Wells Fargo and VW, where people were handed down ridiculous goals and said, make it or you could be fired, at which point they immediately started cheating and doing unethical behavior. So if you want OKRs to be moonshot goals, which is how Google talks about it, um, it has to be okay to not make it. In fact, you almost have to expect to not make it. Um, I love OKRs because I'm curious, like, what am I actually capable of? I'll never know until I try something hard, but it has to be safe. And it's the same thing with companies. If you don't tie compensation to the OKRs, you make it clear, we actually expect you to not make these. Um, and it's okay as long as you learn and you make amazing progress, then people are gonna set really crazy goals. And that's good because until you are playful, you don't know what you're capable of. Um, and you have to also think about how am I gonna do this for longer periods over time? Is this actually sustainable? I heard an amazing story from a friend of mine who's a VP of product. And he said his team set ridiculous goals and then killed themselves to make it. And something there was wrong. You know, It, it should have been, they set interesting goals. They worked really hard to make them, um, but not killing themselves and they learned something that allowed them to be more effective in the next quarter. And so there's a concept I'm gonna drop right now, which is called balancing results. So when you set your key results, you can say, oh, we wanna make this amazing revenue number and the team um, doesn't work more than 50 hours a week. I mean, sorry, it's America in the Silicon Valley, you know, 50 hours is a vacation for some people here, so. Absolutely. So uh, let's say a company has uh, gone through it. They've set some realistic yet ambitious uh, uh, OKRs. What does it then take to actually achieve these? And I think this then comes into the question of focus. So uh, from, from your work and your research, uh, what usually gets in the way of people uh, achieving these OKRs and how can those hurdles be overcome? <sighs> There's, there's patterns I've seen for sure. So thank you for that question. Um, a lot of times people set way too many OKRs. Um, if you're on a team, you have a base level of work usually that you have to do, right? Um, if you're a manager, you have to do performance reviews, you have to go to a certain amount of meetings, et cetera. So you really have to think about capacity. I've seen somebody with a 12 person team have as many OKRs as they have people and everybody's working on it one twelfth of the time. That's just crazy, right? How are you going to do anything good? How are you going to get everything done? So it's good to step back a little bit and say, what can we do with these OKRs? Should we do one first and then the other? So my favorite example is acquisition, conversion, and retention. If we do retention first, we spend an entire quarter thinking about how do we make our customers love us and stay with us? Then when we go to conversion, all that work on conversion, we're not losing people. We're not converting them and having them leave, which is awesome. And then when we go to acquisition and we're spending a lot of money on the top of the funnel, they convert and they will also will retain them. And the thing is the company gets smarter. If you spend an entire working, uh, quarter working on retention, then you, when you switch to conversion, you're not gonna forget everything you learned. So you're actually building company capabilities and that focus, that strength, um, in knowing I'm gonna really learn this extremely well. And it, it creates a very robust company, a company full of very smart people that are constantly learning and teaching each other. 
What about some other tips on staying focused? I'm sure radical focus, uh, OKRs was not the only thing you were talking about in there. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the things about keeping focus, gosh, um, I come from a long line of people with ADHD, as my daughter would tell you, and focus is actually really, really a personal struggle. And that's probably why I was um, so attracted to OKRs because people will come to you and they'll say, you know, I'll pay you a bunch of money to give a talk or we'll pay you a bunch of money for ads, even though your company maybe doesn't want to run ads. And these opportunities are always showing up and distracting you. And if you know what you're about and you know what you're supposed to be doing this quarter, it becomes easier to say not now or even later. Um, for me, talking about focus, wow. Um, I find I'm a big user of this cube timer. Um, I really, I really love it. It's so it's basically um, a small cube, a physical cube that has five, 10, 20, and 30 on it. And you just flip it to whatever amount of time you want to focus. And then I'll just work for that period of time. And then when it goes off, um, I'll stop and I'll get up and I'll stretch. I have been struggling with back problems, which I think everybody has now that we're all living online full time. So having that bell go off um, and say, okay, now stretch yourself. It's a Pomodoro method variation basically, but I just love the cube timer because it's so physical. There's a, this act of physically flipping it and putting it back. I think a lot of us like want everything to be online and actually sometimes the real world is the better world <laughs> to live in. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I put up my Soji screen so I can't see all my pretty books because um, I always want to go over and read them. I turn off my notifications. I'm about to start trying a focusing app. Um, focus, focus is something you don't do with willpower. You do by manipulating your environment and you just have to keep experimenting until you find the thing that works for you. Now, something that's come up during our conversation that I'm interested in is uh, you've spent a lot of time working in very technology uh, focused, let's say data driven organizations. Uh, but during your introduction, you said you also worked at a uh, sort of a creativity um, organization. I, I can't remember if it was a center of the arts or- or Oh uh, yes, California College of the Arts. It's an 108, nine year old art school, believe it or not. Yeah, um, and my background is in painting. I went to art school myself. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah. So what have you found uh, being either similar or unexpectedly different between those stereotypically different uh, groups of people? Oh gosh, yeah. Going from an art school to the Stanford Computer Science Program, you'd think they were day and night, but they really, they really aren't. Um, Gosh, I find that engineers are some of programmers and computer scientists are some of the most creative people I know because they have these incredible constraints, right? What can code do? What can code not do? So their nature has to be creative. Um, and so this idea of the right brain, the left brain, the war between the rational and the creative, I think it's all a mythology. Um, and it was one I grew up on, you know, my parents were like, we're not math people, we're not sports people. I ended up going to art school, I believe I waited tables and painted and I really thought everybody who worked in an office was a sucker, you know. Um, and then I started working on technology and I was like, where have you been all my life? Like, I love making websites. I love that I can make something with my hands and publish it and it starts to affect people almost immediately, right? And being able to shape millions of people's lives, like when I was in Yahoo at the peak of uh, the first internet boom, you know, I would launch something and within hours, I would know whether or not it worked. And if you're the kind of creative person who wants to make things to speak to other people, it's just powerfully satisfying. Um, if you're the kind of creative person who wants to make things for yourself and your own joy, that's wonderful. That's super okay. And, you know, you can go on the internet and find other people to support you and talk about your struggles. Jessica Abel, who wrote the really wonderful uh, Growing Gills, um, she and I have met through the interwebs and we're constantly saying, how do I do my creative work while I'm still doing, um, you know, the more, uh, you call it your, your rational work, your day job, whatever. How do I do the wacky stuff I want to do just for myself while I'm still doing the things that pay the bill? Um, I think when I taught at CCA, 
the students were scared of a lot of things that I wish they weren't afraid of, you know, like, oh God, am, am I gonna have to code that? Uh, um, oh, it's out that you can get a tool to do the things you suck at. But sometimes if you're not afraid, if you just try something, you'll find out that you're better at more things than you think you are. And I think that's been a lot of my life is sort of detangling what stories I tell myself are true and what stories I tell myself are, are not true. I think there's a, a lot of creative people who maybe succumb to this mythology that uh, in order to be creative, you need to uh, stay away from focus to a degree. And you mentioned some writers who say, though they, have, they haven't written in, in weeks or months. Um, there's this fine balance between uh, people who aspire to be creative and who are productively creative. And uh, most of the, the, the famous creatives throughout uh, history um, were actually extremely productive and, uh, and had routines which allowed them to focus on producing their best work as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, Hemingway only wrote 500 words a day, and that kind of blows my mind because that's actually not very, not a lot of words, right? Um, and he'd just stand up, um, he'd put his typewriter on top of a bureau and sit there and type out. Um, some people write early morning, some people write afternoon. One of the best exercises I ever did came from my um, editor, Kathy Yardley. And she said, um, try for about a week to do your creative thing every day, all day long and track when are you productive? When are you worn out? When do you have energy? And by running that experiment, I discovered, I thought I could only write in the morning, but then I discovered there were two more times of day I could write. I could write, um, basically I write every time I eat is the answer. If I eat something and then after the energy I can write, so I can write really well after breakfast, lunch and dinner, and then it goes away. Um, so I think learning your own rhythm is really important and then sticking to it. Um, and I calendar, that's my answer. Um, calendar as a verb is I have my Google calendar and it says write and it says run and it says walk the dog. And that protects that time from everybody else who wants my time. Okay, Christina, it's been wonderful speaking with you. If people wanna find out more about you, your books, your uh, work, what's the best place they can go to find out more? Well, there is cwoodkey.com, but if you can't remember how to spell that, because my last name is ridiculous, uh, check out Elegant Hack. I originally wrote it, uh, chose that domain because I wrote HTML, but now that, that I'm a writer, it works just as well. Eleganthack.com. Perfect. I'll make sure to get those links down in the description below as well. Uh, Christina, Thank it's you. been wonderful speaking with you, and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. I hope so. Thank you, Nick. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share, and subscribe, and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new you, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.